I will be giving you a lecture entitled COVID-19, a 21st century pandemic. The learning objectives are to define COVID-19, explain the clinical subclassification of COVID-19, mild, moderate, severe, and critical COVID-19 according to the WHO criteria, understanding the causative agent of COVID-19, which is SARS coronavirus 2, including its molecular structure, the mechanism of gaining access into the uh, host cell, as well as the mode of transmission. The relationship of SARS coronavirus 2, which is the causative agent of COVID-19, with other coronaviruses that can potentially cause disease in humans, and understanding how the virus causes lung injury and distant vascular injury and thrombosis, as well as this a distinct cytokine storm that we see in patients with severe and critical COVID-19. The importance of the interferon-driven immune response is a critical determinant of clinical outcome. And finally, the basic principles behind the vaccine that targets the novel coronavirus. The title of this talk is COVID-19, a 21st century pandemic. What is COVID-19? COVID-19 is the disease caused by the novel coronavirus designated Severe Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, coronavirus 2. The designation 19 refers to its identification in 2019 in Wuhan, China. The name SARS coronavirus 2 reflects that the virus is the direct successor of its predecessor, SARS coronavirus that caused the 2002-2004 pan pandemic. So what is the disease course in COVID-19? Following transmission of the virus, the virus incubates for a couple of days up to two weeks, typically four days, before the patient develops symptoms. About 25% of patients, however, are asymptomatic. The vast majority of patients have relatively uh, mild disease, which would include flu-like symptoms such as fever, myalgias, cough, anorexia, and sometimes loss of smell, with most patients not experiencing any shortness of breath. But about 20% of patients are more symptomatic and do have shortness of breath. This is the subset that can potentially develop severe and critical COVID-19, characterized by significant shortness of breath with poor oxygen saturation, less than 90% on room air. Now, according to the WHO, if the oxygen saturation is to a diminished degree that requires oxygen support with nasal cannula, that would qualify as severe COVID-19, and if it requires frank ventilator support, that would qualify as critical COVID-19. Patients with severe and critical COVID-19 have certain risk factors, including an older age, greater than 50, but with increasing risk proportionate to the chronological age. So patients in their 60s, 70s, and 80s would be at significantly higher risk, hypertension, obesity, pre-existing cardiac and pulmonary disease, and diabetes mellitus. SARS coronavirus 2 is a virus. So what is a virus? A virus is not a living organism, but it is an infectious agent, and it replicates exclusively in a living cell. There are diverse hosts ranging from plants to microorganisms to animals. The virus exists as genetic material, either DNA or RNA, and when it infects the cell, the host replicates thousands of copies of the genetic material. A virion includes the genetic material and a protein coat or capsid, which surrounds the genetic material, and in some cases, an additional envelope rich in lipids. Viruses are much smaller than bacteria and can only be seen ultrastructurally and are really not um, visualized using a normal optical microscope. Viruses can be grouped by their genome, and we have seven different groups. Group one is a double-stranded DNA. An example would be the herpetic viruses. Group two is a single-stranded DNA virus, um, such as parvovirus. Group Three is a double-stranded RNA virus, such as rotavirus. Group four is a single-stranded RNA virus, which would include the beta coronaviruses, which would encompass the SARS coronavirus 2. Group five is a single-stranded RNA virus, uh, such as influenza. Group six 
is a single-stranded RNA virus that uses reverse transcription for encoding genetic material, best exemplified by human immunodeficiency virus infection. Group 7 is a double-stranded DNA that again requires reverse transcription for encoding genetic material. Um, an example would be hepatitis B. So how closely related is the SARS coronavirus 2 to the SARS coronavirus, the original uh, coronavirus that caused the 2002-2004 pandemic, and the Middle Eastern Respiratory um, Syndrome coronavirus. Well, the SARS coronavirus, SARS coronavirus 2, and MERS coronavirus are members of the beta coronavirus family, representing positive single sense, single stranded RNA viruses. The natural vector is the bat. There is significant genetic homology between SARS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus 2. SARS coronavirus caused the 2002-2004 pandemic, while the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus caused outbreaks in the Middle East starting in 2012. SARS coronavirus and SARS coronavirus 2 enter a host cell with a specific receptor on that host cell called ACE2. And we'll talk about ACE2 in a moment. Well, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus uses a different receptor to gain access into the host cell, which is the dipeptidyl peptidase 4. So here we have the human beta coronaviruses and the cell entry receptors. As I was mentioning, these three particular coronaviruses are bat-borne viruses. There is a total of seven coronaviruses that do cause disease in humans. Um, three of them use the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 to gain entry into a cell, namely SARS coronavirus, SARS coronavirus 2, and the human coronavirus NL63. And what is particularly interesting is that even though the human coronavirus NL63 uses the ACE2 to gain access into the host cell, it causes fairly mild disease, basically a cold-like uh, illness. And so that's kind of interesting, um, given the fact that the other two coronaviruses using the same receptor have the ability to cause such severe disease in humans. Um, it has been suggested that the basis of this milder disease is a weaker interaction with ACE2 than the SARS coronavirus spike-like protein implicated um, or associated with either SARS coronavirus or SARS coronavirus uh, 2. So what are the animal origins of the SARS coronavirus, the Middle Eastern coronavirus, and the SARS coronavirus 2? Well, it's basically, as I was mentioning, it is a bat-borne, these are bat-borne viruses. Um, in the original SARS coronavirus pandemic, there was an intermediary host, which was the civet uh, cat. In the Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome coronavirus, the intermediary host is, is a camel. And in the SARS coronavirus um, 2, likely the bat is still that host that originally infected humans, but there is some question uh, that possibly the pangolin, uh, which is also referred to as the anteater, could potentially define uh, an intermediary host. And what is you know, particularly fascinating is that the bat who is infected with the um, coronavirus actually does not develop any kind of an illness. The virus is basically asymptomatic in the bat it infects. So what is the basic structure of the SARS coronavirus 2? And, and how does the virus enter a human cell? So here we have a cross-section of a SARS coronavirus 2 virion. We have the single-stranded RNA, which is intimately intertwined with nucleocapsid. And this genetic material, which is what replicates in the human uh, cell and other uh, host cells, is surrounded by capsid, a capsid or capsule. And this capsid or capsule uh, contains proteins, including the M protein, the envelope protein, and very importantly, the spike glycoprotein. And if you look, the spike glycoprotein emanates from the surface of the capsid or capsule to really produce this um, crown 
or corona um, around the virus, hence the designation of coronavirus. And it is the spike glycoprotein that interacts directly with the ACE2 on the host cell. ACE2 standing for angiotensin converting enzyme 2. Um, and basically the spike glycoprotein has two subunits. There is the S1 subunit, which is the portion of the spike glycoprotein that interacts directly with ACE2. And then there's the so-called S2 subunit, and the S2 subunit is what allows the fusion of the viral capsid membrane with the actual cell membrane. And that uh, S2 subunit is what ultimately enables the virion to gain access into the cell, to actually enter into the cell through membrane-membrane fusion via the mechanism of endocytosis. So to emphasize then, the spike glycoprotein, which is that um, critical protein that defines the corona, the crown, has two different portions, the S1 subunit, which is the receptor binding motif that binds to ACE2, and the S2 subunit, which is the stock fusion domain that allows the fusion of the viral and host cell membranes. Um, and of interest, the um, American bi biotechnology company Regeneron Pharmaceuticals has developed a monoclonal antibody cocktail which targets the spike glycoprotein. And it is um, uh, approved for administration uh, to treat mild to moderate COVID-19 in people who are um, greater than 12 years of age um, and who weigh at least uh, 88 pounds with positive results for sars cov two testing and who would be considered at significant risk for disease progression um, into severe and critical COVID-19. So how is sars cov two transmitted? Well, the transmission of sars cov two can occur through direct, indirect, or close contact with infected people through infected secretions such as saliva and respiratory secretions or the respiratory droplets, which are expelled when an infected person coughs, sneezes, talks, or sings. Um, Respiratory droplets are greater than 5 to 10 microns in diameter, and respiratory droplet transmission can occur when a person is in close contact, that is within one meter, with an infected person who has respiratory symptoms, coughing or sneezing, or who's talking or singing. And in these circumstances, respiratory droplets that include virus can reach the mouth, nose, or eyes of a susceptible person and result in an infection. Now, Droplets that are less than five microns in diameter are referred to as droplet nuclei or aerosols. And they can travel quite far greater than a meter and could be a method of transmission in closed spaces. Indirect contact transmission involving a contact of a susceptible host with a contaminated object or surface, so-called fomite transmission, is, is possible um, but not proven and probably unlikely as a means of uh, transmitting the, vi the virus. So since January of 2020, there have been over 9 million uh, new cases of, of COVID-19 um, with, with the number of deaths um, in excess of 230,000 to give an overall mortality uh, of roughly 2.5. And one thing that uh, the COVID-19 is exhibiting, which other pandemics have exhibited, is this um, the, these waves of infection, the so-called pandemic waves. And hypothesized mechanisms include um, you know, social behaviors, uh, like school openings and closing, or even the get-together for the, for the holiday seasons, Thanksgiving and, and Christmas, uh, temperature changes, waning immunity, and of course, viruses are always susceptible to developing new mutations. And uh, this is an example of, the, of a pandemic wave that was experienced um, in the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918-1919, which was due to a different virus, uh, namely the H1N1 influenza uh, virus.
So what are the disease mechanisms that underlie severe and critical COVID-19 of adults? SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. So what causes SARS coronavirus 2 associated lung failure? We breathe in air, it goes through the uh, trachea, uh, through the bronchial tree, and then ultimately that breathed in air ends up in the terminal lung parenchyma. And the terminal lung parenchyma is composed of alveolar um, ducts and air sacs called alveoli. And those alveoli are juxtaposed to small blood vessels called capillaries that are housed in uh, septa. And it is that terminal lung parenchyma that really defines the critical uh, area of the lung for um, oxygen exchange, gas exchange. So this is a light microscopic, that's under the microscope, depiction of the terminal lung parenchyma. That is the inhaled oxygen capillary exchange unit. So let's take a look at, at, at the terminal lung parenchyma microscopically. So here we have the alveolar spaces that will contain oxygen. And these alveolar spaces are juxtaposed to these thin, delicate uh, septa within which course capillaries, the septal capillaries. And these septal capillaries are patent. They are filled with red blood cells and they're lined by a cell type called the endothelium. And basically the oxygen um, traverses through the endothelium of the capillaries and is taken up by the red blood cells and then transmitted um, to the rest of the body. And if the capillaries, if these individual small blood vessels are injured, then gas exchange cannot occur and oxygenation does not occur. So what happens in fatal COVID-19 and uh, you know, severe and critical COVID-19 where patients have um, profound difficulty in oxygenation? Well, lung injury occurs and it is really in the context of targeted septal capillary injury. So basically, when you look at the interalveolar septa, instead of um, com being composed of the patent capillaries that contain red blood cells, instead the interalveolar septal capillaries are profoundly injured. Um, there is endothelial cell necrosis with extensive activation of the clotting pathway leading to the deposition of fibrin that is a product of coagulation pathway activation due to endothelial cell injury whereby this fibrin is deposited in the wall and also occludes the microvascular lumens. So basically in fatal COVID pneumonitis and severe uh, COVID-19 and critical COVID-19, there is a profound uh, necrotizing thrombotic septal capillary injury phenomenon that would then prevent the oxygen from passing through the endothelium uh, into the capillaries and oxygenate the rest of the body. That critical gas exchange does not occur because of this injury to the septal capillaries. So how does the virus you know, cause the septal capillary injury that prevents the gas exchange? That becomes the critical question. So the, the answer we think um, is complement activation. And I will talk about the complement pathway so you understand what the complement pathway is. We've been um, studying complement-mediated microvascular injury for many years, and it turns out that this uh, pattern of what I refer to as relatively posse cellular, that cell poor, uh, necrotizing thrombotic capillary injury, is a pattern that is very characteristic for complement-mediated vascular injury. And we were able to uh, quickly determine that in fact the basis of that septal capillary injury syndrome in, co in severe fatal COVID-19 
is confluent activation within the microvessels. We have immunohistochemical stains that we can do to highlight components of confluent pathway activation. And we use, um, in, in the images that we see here, utilize a, um, the technique of highlighting the confluent is a dimenobenzidine technique, which will um, produce this brown granular reaction pattern. And you can see how the septal capillaries exhibit this very extensive, fine granular staining pattern um, for components of complement activation, including C4D and C5B-9. In addition, MASP2 is a um, sign of madam binding lectin pathway complement activation, and that too was positive in the septal capillaries. So it, it is a complement mediated vascular injury syndrome. So what is the complement pathway? Well, the complement system is composed of proteins, including C1Q, C1R, C3, C3D, C4D, and so on and so forth. The non-cleaved complement proteins, such as C1Q, C2, C4, and C5, are produced by the liver, and they circulate in the blood as an inactive molecule. They have the ability to be stimulated by certain triggers that will result in the cleavage of a specific complement protein into another version of itself, such as C2 into C2A, C3 into C3A and C3B, C4 into C4A and C4B, and C5 into C5A and C5B. And the assembly of the cleaved complement proteins to eventuate in the formation of and the fusion of C5B, C6, C7, C8, and C9 to produce the very critical C5B-9, which is also referred to as the membranolytic attack complex. That's the end product of complement pathway activation. And it is that membranolytic attack complex that will produce these transmembrane pores that will um, basically damage the cell or microbe and result in its cell death. While very protective against infections, the complement pathway activation leading to the formation of C5B-9 can damage host cells. And if the target is the endothelium, which is the cell that lines the blood vessel, that complement activation will result in microvascular injury, as we see with fatal severe critical COVID-19 pneumonitis. Um, and once you have damaged the endothelium and the endothelium um, sloughs off, that exposes type 4 collagen, which will activate the clotting pathway and generate the formation of fibrin, um, which will then be deposited in the wall and uh, really clot off the vascular lumens. That's the sort of sequelae of that complement mediated endothelial cell injury. And there are, in fact, three of these pathways in the human body. The classic pathway involves antibody antigen interaction and would be um, activated in the setting of autoimmune disease like lupus erythematosus. Then we have the man and binding lectin pathway, which is an innate pathway um, that is activated with infections because certain microbial pathogens will have mannose residues on their surface that will interact with mannan binding lectin and activate this pathway. Now the alternative pathway is interesting. This is the third pathway and it can become activated when these other two pathways are activated because the injury that occurs when you activate the classic and lectin pathway will be a stimulus for alternative pathway activation. All these pathways will eventuate in the formation of the membranolytic attack complex, or C5B-9, which will then generate that pore through a cell and damage the cell. So the question is, okay, we know that the lung injury is this necrotizing septal capillary injury phenomenon triggered by complement activation. But how does the virus cause 
compound activation in the septal capillaries, which in turn results in microvascular injury and prevents gas exchange. Why does that happen? So this is actually from our translational research um, paper, where we were able to demonstrate that the septal uh, capillary complement deposition, so here we have an interalveolar septa with the many capillaries that are injured that have all this C4D, which is highlighted in brown, um, but it turns out that the capillaries, not only do they have complement, but they have the viral capsid protein localized to the vessel walls. So there's actual co-localization of C4D and components of the SARS coronavirus 2 capsid or capsule, including spike glycoprotein, which is that um, part of the capsid that binds to ACE2. We use an interesting software called Nuance software that will convert the um, chromogen stains into a fluorescent signal. So for example, in this particular image, the septa have sort of a bronzy appearance because there is co-localization with C4D, which is in brown, with spike-like a protein, which is highlighted by a red chromogen. Using the Nuance software, one will convert that brown signal, which is C4D, into a green signal, while the red chromogen that highlights the spike-like a protein using this software will be converted into a red signal. And then when you co-localize the two together and merge the signals, green and red, that will produce these areas of bright yellow fluorescence, which basically proves that the septal capillary uh, complement activation was associated with the deposition of spike glycoprotein uh, from the SARS coronavirus uh, along with other associated viral capsid proteins within the microvasculature. So the next question is, why does the binding of the spike like a protein and other capsid proteins with or without nucleic capsid and RNA, in other words, you know, with or without the intact virus, why, why does at least the capsid proteins um, localize to the septal capillaries? Why does that happen and presumably triggers this you know, complement activation? Well, as I was mentioning, the critical um, receptor to allow the virus to gain entry into a host cell is the ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme 2. And it turns out that the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 is expressed within the septal capillary endothelium. So here we have a microvessel, and this microvessel is lined by endothelium. And basically, we have a double uh, stain for the microvessel, whereby the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 is highlighted in a red chromogen, while the SARS coronavirus capsid protein is highlighted with a brown chromogen. And once again, using that nuance software, we convert the red chromogen, which highlights ACE2, into a red signal and we convert the brown signal, which highlights the capsid protein, also found in the endothelium, with a green signal, and then when you merge the two signals together, that will produce this bright yellow fluorescence that proves that the SARS coronavirus capsid protein um, is uh, bound to the endothelium, likely because of that ACE2 spike like a protein receptor interaction and it would appear whether we're dealing with intact virus or not intact virus that the spike like a protein does travel with the capsid uh, with the other components of the capsid uh, of the capsule including an envelope and membrane uh, protein so what is ace2 ace2 stands for angiotensin converting enzyme 2 ace2 is a transmembrane protein that is the functional receptor for SARS coronavirus 2 and allows the virus to gain entry into the cell. This receptor, however, is very important for cardiovascular health. Why? Because this enzyme results in the hydrolysis of angiotensin 1, 
which is a vasoconstrictor, into angiotensin 7, which exhibits protective vasodilatory properties. When the SARS coronavirus 2 spike like a protein binds to ACE2, that ACE2 becomes endocytosed into the cell. Remember through that S2 subunit fusion protein? And it's no longer available to effectively achieve the hydrolytic conversion that contributes clearly to the cardiovascular demise that characterizes severe anticritical COVID-19. And we'll talk a bit more about the um, extra pulmonary aspects of severe anticritical COVID-19. So how does the SARS coronavirus um, capsid proteins, and, and specifically the spike like a protein, and presumably it sort of travels uh, with it, uh, the other capsid proteins, um, actually activate the conflict pathway? Why does that happen? Well, it turns out that when you look at the spike glycoprotein from a biochemical perspective, it has certain residues, uh, certain uh, sugar moieties or residues on its surface, the spike, that will interact with mannan binding lectin. And that interaction between spike glycoprotein and certain residues on the circulating mannan binding lectin will then result in activation of MASP2 that cleaves C4 to C4A and C4B and then eventuates ultimately in the formation of C5B-9, which will then drill a hole into the endothelium and result in cell death. Because remember that spike like a protein, not, not only does it interact with man and binding lectin to produce C5B-9, but that spike like a protein is actually bound to the endothelium by ACE2. So endothelium is damaged almost like an innocent bystander by C5B-9 as the molecule does generate the pore and leads to cell death. What this diagram sort of emphasizes is that when one activates that mannan binding lectin pathway through that spike like a protein mannan binding lectin interaction, that will generate factors that will activate the clotting pathway and therefore contribute to the um, hypercoagulable uh, procoagulant state that underlies severe and critical COVID 19, but also. There is crosstalk um, with the alternative conflict pathway. So when you activate the mannabinding lectin pathway, you will also activate the alternative pathway, uh, providing another um, conflict pathway that can contribute to uh, microvascular um, injury. And probably the main mechanism by which mannabinding lectin pathway activation activates the alternative pathway is simply by um, the cells that are damaged with this pathway activation will serve as a trigger to activate the alternative pathway. Severe critical COVID-19 is, is not only a disease that affects the lung and causes that severe septal capillary injury syndrome that eventuates into respiratory failure, but it really is a multi-organ vascular disease. So how does severe critical COVID-19 eventuate from its initial presentation in the lung to a progressive multi-organ syndromic complex with the common theme being microvascular and larger vessel thrombosis? Well, it turns out that the skin is an important window for understanding the principles of disease underlying severe and critical COVID-19. Patients who have severe and critical COVID-19 where um, they are in respiratory failure on a ventilator in the ICU, they develop a very distinctive skin rash called thrombotic retiform purpura. That's the term we have coined for this distinct rash. And here we have a buttock where in, in a pa this is from a patient who was in the ICU on a ventilator where um, one can see this net-like purplish discoloration of the skin. A skin biopsy demonstrated a very striking relatively posse-cellular, necrotizing thrombogenic vasculopathy, more or less mirroring 
what we see in the lung in patients who um, have fatal COVID-19. These are microvessels, and these microvessels show endothelial cell injury with extensive, occlusive fibrin thrombi, um, really clotting off and obscuring the vascular lumens. And this thrombogenic vasculopathy with endothelial cell injury is clearly complement mediated. Here we have a diaminobenzidine uh, stained slide for um, C5B-9, the membrane electrotac complex, and we can see all this extensive granular deposition within the microvessels. This collage um, shows you um, how the SARS coronavirus 2 capsid proteins, and by that I mean spike like a protein, the membrane and envelope uh, proteins from the capsule, how, like we saw in the lung, show this distinct pattern of endothelial cell localization with concomitant complement pathway activation. So here we have the actual skin sample from the thrombotic perperk retiform skin rash. These are microvessels, and these microvessels demonstrate very striking accumulations of the SARS coronavirus 2 uh, capsid membrane in the endothelium. Um, a similar pattern was also seen with spike glycoprotein. But interestingly, when we biopsied their normal skin, we saw the same pattern of capsid protein localization to the endothelium with complement activation. It was my suspicion that given the fact that these patients were developing this cutaneous reaction um, that more or less mirrored the complement mediated vascular injury in the lung, that these patients must have what we refer to as systemic complement activation. And one of the um, tests that we do to rule in or out systemic complement activation is a biopsy of normal skin, and we usually use the deltoid skin. Um, and indeed, these patients had evidence of systemic complement activation because in their normal skin, they had so much complement deposition in their microvessels, but these microvessels also showed localization of the capsid proteins, including membrane, envelope, and the spike like a protein, as did, of course, their diseased um, thrombosed skin. And these are just images of the apparently normal skin showing significant deposits within the endothelium of the capsid proteins, including the envelope, uh, the membrane, and the spike like a protein, um, corroborating the diagnosis of systemic complement activation syndrome, but intimately linked with this SARS coronavirus 2 um, capsid protein localization. And as it turns out, um, this pattern of microvascular thrombosis and complement activation with variable viral capsid protein localization to endothelium was not just unique to the lung and to the skin, but it could really be seen in other organ systems. And so at autopsy, when we examined their other organ systems, there was not much in the way of inflammation, which again is to be expected because when we look at complement mediated vascular injury, it tends to not generate a lot of inflammation, but you can see microvascular thrombosis in other organ systems. This is a kidney um, showing microvascular thrombosis and hence patients with severe and critical COVID-19 can develop this ischemic driven type of a, um, kidney, acute kidney injury and go into kidney failure. Um, microvascular thrombi were noted in the liver. Um, in the brain, we also found evidence of microvascular disease attributable to complement activation. These are two tiny capillaries, and they're abnormal because they are not lined by endothelium. The endothelium is gone, and it's gone because of complement mediated vascular injury. And over and above this microvascular thrombosis, similar to what we see in the skin and, the, and in the lung, these patients had evidence of a generalized procoagulant state at autopsy, and so larger vessels showed thrombosis. And not surprisingly, since we've already established that um, severe and critical COVID-19 is a systemic complement um, 
activation syndrome, we did find quite a bit of complement deposition in microvessels um, throughout the body in many organ systems. Here we have um, complement deposition in a microvessel in the heart, in the brain, in the liver, and once again outlining the septal capillaries. Um, the brain involvement I, I thought was very intriguing. We had published this work in our Annals of Diagnostic Pathology paper, and it, it really makes a lot of sense why there was brain involvement. Number one is the microvessels of the cerebral cortex do express ACE2, and so not surprisingly, um, these ACE2 positive vessels also showed evidence of the viral capsid protein, including spike glycoprotein within these ACE2 positive vessels. And of course, that will lead to complement activation through the mechanisms that I've already discussed with you, and hence in the microvessels of the brain, over and above the capsid protein localization to the microvessels, there was evidence of complement activation as revealed by C4D, C5E-9 deposition within the microvessels. Um, when when looks at extrapulmonary microvascular SARS coronavirus 2 spike like a protein um, deposition, it more or less mirrors the ACE2 expression in the extrapulmonary microvasculature. And so we found that ACE2 and with it the SARS coronavirus 2 um, capsid proteins were at the highest level in the deep dermis and fat. We had an opportunity of studying many samples of normal skin. Um, both pre-mortem and post-mortem, um, and the brain microvasculature. That, those two organs show the greatest extent of vascular viral protein, ACE2 complement, and also cytokine expression outside of the lung. And a way to rank microvascular uh, ACE2, and again, we're talking about extra pulmonary, so outside of the lung, um, it was skin, especially the fat, so it was, it was greatest really in the fat, followed by the brain and then the liver, and it was significantly less in the placenta, kidney, and heart. Now, what was very intriguing um, in our work was the fact that we did find the viral capsid proteins, including envelope, membrane, and spike like a protein, in, in a variety of organ systems throughout the body, but that doesn't necessarily mean that those um, organs have actual replicative virus. You can have uh, what we refer to as pseudovirion localization without an intact virus. And as it turns out, uh, the actual viral replication as determined by the detection of um, single stranded RNA was very limited. It was um, really limited to the alveolar um, macrophages and also the alveolar septal capillaries. We, we did see evidence of SARS coronavirus 2 RNA, and of course, clearly in the nasopharynx. But it was very difficult to find significant viral replication as determined by um, this technique to pick up on SARS coronavirus 2 RNA distribution outside of the nasopharynx and the lung. Our ultrastructural studies, um, which Dr. Session, the head of our electromicroscopy um, division and the head of renal pathology, um, has conducted, more or less confirmed our um, RNA PCR work, uh, our RNA in situ PCR work. She was unable to find unequivocal um, virions in the endothelium outside of the lung. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to the ultrastructural image of classic virions within the endothelium of the uh, microvessels of the lung. Um, here we have the SARS coronavirus 2 virion. We can see the uh, sort of fuzzy edge, which are all the spike uh, glycoproteins emanating from the surface. There is this internal dark beading, and that internal dark beading really represents the single stranded RNA intertwined with the nucleic capsid. And very importantly is the fact that these virions are endocytosed and therefore surrounded by an intact membrane, cell membrane, an actual host membrane. There have been um, papers uh, published that would suggest that the SARS coronavirus 2 in fact 
infects endothelium outside of the lung, and that's based on ultra-structural assessment. But if you actually look at those ultra-structural images, um, what they are illustrating in these papers are not true virions. They're clathrin-coated vesicles, which are part of the normal organelle. And this is an example of these clathrin-coated vesicles. They kind of have a SARS coronavirus 2 virion look, um, but there is no internal uh, feeding, which again represents that RNA with the nucleocapsid. And most importantly, is the fact that these structures are lying freely in the cytosol and they're not membrane bound. So I, I think if you um, look very objectively at these papers that suggest that SARS coronavirus 2 is this multi organ infectious endotheliolitis, um, really those illustrations are not convincing or compelling for um, definite virions within the endothelium outside of the lung. And so it appears that the binding of spike-like protein to S2 on endothelium um, does not require an intact virion. It can bind to ACE2 as a pseudovirion. And when it binds to ACE2 as a pseudovirion, it does take with it other components of that, uh, of, of that capsid, which would include you know, membrane and envelope, as well as spike-like protein. And we have certainly seen that sort of pseudovirion dissemination in the skin, brain, liver, heart, and kidney, where we do see the capsid protein, but we don't see any RNA in the endothelium or any ultrastructural evidence of frank infection. So viral replication in the nasopharynx and lung is determined by the immune response and is a critical determinant in disease severity. Patients with severe and critical COVID-19 have excessive levels of replicating intact virus localized to the septal capillaries of the lung. Younger patients who launch a very robust immune response have very little evidence of active viral replication. And in fact, when you um, examine uh, nasopharyngeal swabs in, in younger patients, they may even be uh, negative. So what is the pathophysiology that underlines the ability to control the extent of viral replication, which in turn is a critical factor in determining disease severity. Well, once again, the skin really serves as an important window for understanding the um, pathophysiology of COVID-19. There are two distinct acral presentations of COVID-19, and they reflect two very different clinical spectrums of the disease process. In panel a, we have COVID-19 perniosis, also referred to as the purple toes, the COVID toes that we see in young children who are otherwise asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic with the virus. And in fact, when you uh, do nasal pharyngeal swabs in these patients, they're typically negative. Uh, it, it bears a tremendous amount of resemblance to a condition called idiopathic perniosis, which we know is related to a high level of type 1 interference, and by the way, interference interfere with viral replication. So idiopathic pernia, which COVID toes resembles, is an interferonopathy. So that provides an interesting uh, sort of insight into what COVID toes is due to. And panel C is the thrombotic blotchy reniform purpura, um, typically at an acral site, including the toes, that we see in patients that have severe and critical COVID-19, where they're in respiratory failure and they have that multi-organ um, vascular injury syndrome with thrombosis. So this was from our paper uh, that we published in the British Journal of Dermatology, which shows this kind of low power um, view of the COVID toes on the left and the thrombotic rotiform purpura on the right, and they couldn't be more different in their appearance. So in the COVID toes, we have a bluish appearing dermis because of the massive influx of lymphocytes and monocytes into the dermis that is driven by a very potent interferon response. So these patients with COVID toes have a very striking interferon response, and we can evaluate for interferon using uh, an immunohistochemical stain called mixovirus resistance protein. And when that 
protein is upregulated in the skin, that is a sign of positive type 1 interference signaling. And so you can see how the skin biopsy has a brownish appearance because that interference signal is so high, and that will lead to this influx of these immune cells into the skin. And it looks very much like the elevated interferon response we see in idiopathic or classic perineo, which we know is a it is a interferonopathy. These patients actually have a genetic mutation that leads to excessive interference signaling. In panel B, there is no inflammation. The dermis looks pink, and instead the blood vessels are injured and thrombosed, and that is what we see in thrombotic retiform purpura of severe COVID, and the MXA, which is that mixovirus resistance protein stain, which is that type 1 interferon marker, is completely negative. You see there's no staining as opposed to the striking staining we see in COVID toes of the healthy child and in idiopathic perniosis that form freeze interferonopathy. So in the COVID toes of, of children where they um, you know, feel well or they're mildly symptomatic, um, we see this really robust inflammatory cell infiltrate. We have a mononuclear cell dominant you know, interface dermatitis. We have a dense infiltrate of T-cells and HASTE sites that surround and permeate microvessels. We know it's interferon-driven. Not unexpectedly, we don't see any evidence of a complement mediated vascular injury syndrome. When we look for SARS coronavirus 2 RNA, it's minimally positive. And then we look for the SARS coronavirus 2, you know, capsid proteins, which again we saw excessively in the lung and other organ systems, including the skin, in patients with severe COVID, um, we don't see any evidence of the SARS coronavirus capsid proteins in their skin samples. And this is in contradistinction to um, thrombotic retiform purpura, where you know you don't have this kind of inflammation. Um, there is no mix of virus resistance staining, so there's no interferon signaling, so you don't have that critical interferon response to interfere with viral replication, it's absent, it's blunted. Um, and as well, the protein derived from the viral capsule is everywhere in the endothelium, and as a consequence, we have a lot of complement microvascular activation, which in turn produces that C5B-9 that damages the endothelium and leads to the vascular thrombosis. So if one had to sort of summarize the sequence of events that are probably operational or that we would we have proposed as being operational, we would suggest the following. These pseudovirions, which are those capsid proteins, including spike like a protein, and with it it grabs the membrane and envelope, it's released from the virus in the dying endothelial cells in the lung. And again, it's going to be at very high levels because in severe COVID, you don't have the interferon response to stop the viral replication. Those pseudovirions are then released into the circulation. They dock to all those ACE2 positive vessels that are found in different you know, organ systems throughout the body, leading to complement activation because of that spike like a protein man and binding lectin interaction um, and it, it occurs in the skin and fat certainly at the highest levels but also other organ systems and these ACE2 positive microvessels with docked protein engaging man and binding lectin could then serve as a fuel for distant vascular injury and thrombosis because of the crosstalk between the complement pathways remember when you activate the man and binding lectin pathway you activate the alternative pathway, you activate the coagulation pathway. Um, and, and it also provides a pathophysiologic construct for obesity as a risk factor for severe COVID because of a high level of microvascular um, ACE2 in the subcutaneous fat, um, basically. Well, what about the cytokine storm that we see in patients with severe anticritical COVID-19? Patients with severe COVID-19 have elevations of certain cytokines, such as interleukin-6, 
and their blood. And so what are cytokines? Cytokines are small proteins produced from cells, including lymphocytes, where they're called lymphokines, and monocytes, where they are referred to as monokines. However, they can also be produced by the endothelial cell, which we know is a very critical cell involved in the pathogenesis of severe, critical, and fatal COVID-19. Cytokines work in attracting other cells and interleukins, which in turn, you know, influence other cells. So there's little inflammation in severe COVID-19. Um, so where do the elevated cytokines come from and, and what role do they play in the pathogenesis of severe and critical COVID-19? It is our belief that the increased cytokines in severe and fatal COVID-19 originate from the endothelium, um, likely due to mannan binding lectin pathway activation. And the evidence that we really have for that is that, uh, well, number one is when you uh, look at the various organ systems at autopsy in patients with COVID, severe, um, actually fatal COVID-19, there isn't much in the way of a lymphocytic and monocytic infiltrate to suggest that those cells are the source of the cytokines. That's number one. And number two is um, we actually have shown that the endothelium um, in the microvessels in patients with fatal COVID-19, in fact, express the various cytokines that have been found to be elevated in severe and critical COVID-19, including interleukin-6, interleukin-8, TNF-alpha, interleukin-1, um, and other stimulators of the pro-inflammatory cytokine response. And it would appear that when the mannan binding leptin pathway is activated by that spike like a protein mannan binding leptin um, interaction, that that probably is the trigger for the enhanced cytokine response from the endothelium. And it is important to know that um, the release of cytokines, such as IL-6 from the endothelium, can promote uh, platelet aggregation and therefore contribute to the thrombotic tendency that is key to the pathogenesis of severe and critical COVID-19. So um, one of the sequelae of the elevated cytokines is in fact it, it enhances the thrombotic tendency that underlies severe and critical COVID-19. So what about the vaccine? Well, vaccine candidates will induce both cellular memory T cell and humoral antibody immunity. And during COVID-19 infection, a vaccinated individual will clear the virus through neutralizing antibodies, um, activation of the complex pathway and engagement of helper and cytotoxic T cell effector functions. And so when you look at um, you know, potential um, components of the virus that could be targeted um, in terms of vaccine development, in, in point of fact, um, there are uh, a variety of components of the SARS coronavirus 2 that could elicit an appropriate T cell and uh, B cell immune response, including the nucleocapsid protein that is intertwined with single-stranded RNA, the M protein, the um, spike uh, glycoprotein. Um, these components of the virus, and of course the intact virus, um, are capable of eliciting a T cell and humoral immune response, which of course is key in the development of an effective vaccine. Um, the Pharmaceutical companies that have worked on developing the various vaccines have more or less concentrated on the spike glycoprotein, which we have spoken about throughout this um, talk. Uh, and as I was mentioning earlier on in the talk, there are really two components of the spike glycoprotein, the S1 subunit, which is the receptor binding motif, and that stock fusion domain. Um, there are nearly 50 candidate vaccines in clinical testing, four trials in testing in the United States. Now the Moderna vaccine, which will be soon available, and the Pfizer vaccine, which is available, um, they are very similar. They're both nucleoside uh, modified messenger RNA vaccines, whereby that messenger RNA, when it enters a human cell, will encode the spike like a protein. The Moderna vaccine, well, has a messenger RNA that encodes the entire spike like a protein, both the S1 and S2 subunit, while the Pfizer messenger RNA 
will encode the spike-like protein that defines the receptor uh, binding motif. The AstraZeneca uses not a nucleoside messenger RNA, but a modified adenovirus vector vaccine, but once again to encode the spike-like protein. And Janssen also uses a modified adenovirus uh, vector vaccine that encodes the spike-like protein. And the primary endpoint um, in a um, effective vaccine is that you don't, don't want to have any symptoms of any severity um, associated with um, COVID-19 if, in fact, the vaccine is um, supposedly effective. And this is sort of a, a depiction of um, what happens with the messenger RNA vaccines, which are the two vaccines that are available in the United States. Basically, um, following an intramuscular injection using a um, lipid-based nanotechnology, that messenger RNA that encodes the spike like a protein will be endocytosed into the myocyte, um, and that messenger RNA will then be encoded the spike like a protein will be released, whether it's the receptor binding motif part in the, as one sees with the Pfizer vaccine, or the entire spike like a protein, as one sees with the Moderna vaccine. That spike like a protein that is secreted, either the entire spike or part of the spike, will uh, be picked up by dendritic cells derived from monocytes, which will then present this foreign antigen so to speak, to T cells and B cells and therefore elicit uh, an immune response that essentially neutralizes the uh, virus. So in conclusion, with a blunted type of interferon response, SARS coronavirus 2 being endotheliotropic, in other words, it, it actually replicates in the endothelium, the lining cells of the blood vessel, in the lung, microvasculature, although not elsewhere, apart from the nasopharynx. Um, the microvascular compound activation occurs because of the spike like a protein manifolding lectin engagement, and that results in septal capillary injury, and, the, uh, and it really defines the basis of the lung failure in severe and critical COVID-19. Now, the SARS coronavirus 2 pseudovariants, and by that I mean the spike like a protein with the associated viral capsid proteins, um, are released from the damaged endothelium in the septal capillaries of the lung and disseminate systemically um, and localize to select ACE2 positive vessels, where they once again result in mana binding lectin uh, mediated complement activation. And we, we know that that mana binding lectin activation also will cause the endothelium to express cytokines and presumably contribute to the cytokine storm, leading to vascular injury and thrombosis, as well as hypercytic anemia. We know that complement activation amplifies the alternative pathway and activates the coagulation pathway, leading to um, further and distant microvascular injury and thrombosis, um, enhanced expression of IL-6 and other cytokines from the endothelium, uh, probably contributes to the procoagulant state. And so the end result, um, when one is dealing with severe and critical COVID-19, which you know, again only affects a very small percentage of patients, it's really this microangiopathic acute respiratory distress syndrome with significant multi-organ microvascular injury in a procoagulant state um, in the setting of severe and critical COVID-19. And the risk factors are poor type 1 interference signaling, Complement dysregulation, um, for example, in the setting of diabetes mellitus, uh, patients have a very um, defective regulated molecule for a C5B dash and I call C59. Um, and obesity, we already discussed that interesting link in terms of the high levels of ACE2 positive vessels in subcutaneous fat. We understand the pathophysiology of the virus, which has clearly led to more efficacious therapeutic interventions. And um, vaccine development has been at a very accelerated, accelerated rate with um, uh, positive, very positive results. Thank you.